No, no, I, I just want to make sure we don't come up missing on that. This is required TNS. Give you just a second. Give me just recently. Just recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah when it comes up. Mostly, I'm uh, much more interested in CFRG. This is James. This goes first. And then this goes first. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, really Often in the crypto algorithms, you know, the, the foundations, if there are any of those, like, you know, the um, Let me try. This is a Yeah, we still found uh, an X509 in the new bio, so they can now pop this on. In which version? Uh, maybe uh, well, three months ago, maybe, perhaps. Hey, good morning. So, so it works. So one thing I'm finding out, I was thinking on Meet Echo also, figure out how to turn it off. I need to reply. Maybe the Echo is going to be one or one or two. Well, when you talk to us, you absolutely need to close the data line. Okay. Just disconnect it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the question is where is the mic? Not the mic. Where is the the output of the audio here on my computer? So first rewrite the this code is too hard. To I mean, I can put on the screen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then <laughs> later, as part of the drama, people reported that, gee, you know, we don't need to do you have a, you have a video to display for you? For your, uh, you know, um, it's a real issue. You know, okay, I, I, I think I found it. Okay, so we're, we're doing, we're doing yeah. impromptu yeah. remote. Yeah. Oh, hi, Jim. Did you guys talk to you? I talked uh, earlier this morning. Yeah. yeah. So we were thinking of swapping AD because it's more male and it makes more sense. Yeah, that's yeah, some rumors about it. Yeah, so are you going to like to say that this will take over? Uh, so I keep telling Alexi to say when you want to take it over. And the best one to say. Yeah, I, where do I know your name from? Oh, I keep telling him to do it. We can do it today. I, I think it makes no difference. So, yes, yes. Uh, see here? No, you can see. Yeah, right. Right. So, so you heard what I was telling David, right? Yeah. And I think you'll, you'll agree wholeheartedly, right? It was in the. Okay, yeah. Right. And now, to the extent that Google is investing in non proprietary, you know, reasonably portable foundational stuff that I'm still could benefit from. Uh, I would do that to them. I know, but if they, if they write a library, well, I might, if they write some basic functionality, yeah. functionality yeah. that we can import, maybe they would be able to directly import yeah. the, the code that they have using the library. So different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we can still take the library yeah. and they start importing it ourselves. So, you know, if they have a good buffer library, we yeah. can sure. use it. And then well, later, it'll be easier to see yeah, maybe share more code if fixing the issues are more when you get more like last all this month. It doesn't have to be fixed on the top. Yeah. Earlier, but, um, I've noticed all this fuss yeah. about the release. And, uh, I have no comment at all. But yeah, sure, we should have one soon. Um, um, 
but yeah. yes so and um, so if Alexi turns up, we can, why? We, we, we can say that he's worth something. Yeah. To you, right? Yeah, right. All right. <laughs> Open up Excellent. OK, um, Jim, how are you? We're, we're working on the right stuff. See us one for a OK. So I hope that them. you will that they will hear you basically. Uh, my my complaint that you also so heard I, me talking to David is that uh my well, Mito me think I might be easier. Does it work? Does it happen? You see me writing. Oh okay. Uh, now we say maybe uh, for, for Intel. Yeah, I think we might use uh, Miteko then uh, Jim. Well let's try it with Mitoko and use this as uh, fallback if it doesn't work. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. We should start the meeting now. So, if you yeah. so bye. All right, folks. Um, we're uh, we were about to start. We were supposed to start five minutes ago. So everybody, sit down and figure out if you're the right person to take notes or channel jabber. Man, excellent. Thank you, Rich, for channeling jabber. Anybody willing to take notes? We ain't going anywhere without it. Come on, wake up. All right. While you think about that, note the note well. Still, we need a note taker. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we're not gonna. We, we promise not to make any any sort of decisions before you've had a, John Levine has had a chance to drink a bit of coffee and sort of get organized. Um, right, this is UTA. If you wanted to be somewhere else, maybe it's us that's in the wrong place. Who knows? Yeah. Okay, we're trying to get to get back to business. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta do that. Okay, okay, now you can hear me. So today our agenda is again dedicated to email with TLS. Um, and basically we have three presenters here. Um, the last one is going to be remote, hopefully. Uh, and we start, uh, and we go to, according to our agenda, we start with the first one. Uh, the two drafts are going to be presented by the same person and same um, and same uh, deck of slides. So, yeah. So Dan, please come up. All right. Yeah. Just... Thank you. Um, so I think, uh, you're going to have to tell me what to flip. I'll just, I'll tell you when to flip. Yeah, that's cool. Um, okay. So I'm Dan Margolis. I'm, uh, talking about two drafts, which probably most of you have already seen, or hopefully you have already seen. One is, uh, reporting of TLS, uh, delivery failures for SNTP. And the other is SNTP strict transport security. Um, and I'm just going to sort of mash them together. So there's one, uh, one slide deck and I kind of covered them in one piece. Um, mostly these are sort of small updates since the last update we gave at ITF 95. I think no big changes that will surprise people and we'll sort of talk about um, where we plan to go, where our uh, deployment efforts are and sort of hopefully get some useful feedback from you guys. So um, next slide, please. Um, so sort of really short 60 second overview of SP STS for people who aren't familiar with it. We have a, a text record on the mail delivery domain which says I support STS. Um, we have a HTTPS endpoint with the policy describing when you expect uh, TLS connections to this domain and uh, what senders should sort of look for in the MX and this kind of thing. And um, essentially, this looks like HSTS. So we use uh, web PKI validation, so cert validation based on a, a trusted certificate authority. Um, we enforce this by sort of caching the policy for a long time, and every time we talk to this domain, from here on, we sort of expect the policy to match until it expires or is updated. Um, and, and finally, we have this report or enforce mode. So we can sort of do soft deployments and uh, report failures, but not actually bounce mail uh, until we're sort of comfortable that things work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
So between the last draft and the current one, we made, I think, three significant changes. The first is that we split out reporting. We thought that that was sort of generally useful and the people who didn't implement STS might still benefit from reporting, either because they want to know about uh, TLS failures with start TLS or because they want to know about Dane failures or just sort of a, a generally useful thing. Um, that's now its own text record, which just describes where to send failures. And as shown there, it can be a mail to link or not shown there, it can be a uh, HTTP link instead. So you can report out of band, you know, upload a report sort of like HPKP supports and say uh, essentially what uh, what MXs you talked to, what failures you saw, and sort of provide general stats there. Um, I think that's largely uncontroversial, and I'm, I'm actually not going to spend that much more time on TLS RPT because I think it's extremely simple and sort of generally useful. Um, second change, we um, essentially simplified the, the text record. So the point of the text record in our first proposal was it had a copy of the proposal, but because we're not assuming DNSSEC, it, it's it's really just uh, a co sorry a copy of the policy, uh, which serves just to indicate which version of policy you should be looking at, whether you should look at the HTTPS endpoint. And so we're using DNS as sort of a signaling layer. And so we've simplified this to make it clear that you, you actually can't rely on the DNS record. It's just a copy of sort of a, an ID that uniquely identifies the current version of the policy. You want to get the policy, you go to the HTTPS endpoint. So this was discussed also on the mailing list. Um, I, I don't think it's hugely controversial. Um, the, the third point is we uh, had sort of previously had this, I think, somewhat hacked up effort to sort of coexist with DNSSEC for sort of validating the, the DNS records and uh, Dane for authenticating MXs. And I, I think it caused a lot of problems, both in terms of extra complexity and in terms of um, sort of the lack of clarity on what to do if like the, the recipient domain has a Dane policy which doesn't validate and the STS policy said rely on Dane and do report only mode. So this is sort of an odd scenario where if you look at Dane only, you would fail the message, but if you look at STS, you might be less clear. And so we basically just wholesale eliminated the DNSSEC from the proposal. Um, I, I think now it's sort of more clearly an alternative, and um, I think they can coexist. I think there's no real downside to implementing both, but um, you know they're, they're now separate, and uh, I, I think it just makes things a lot simpler. So those are the three significant changes. Next slide, please. And we closed a bunch of other issues between draft 00 and draft 01, um, I think largely syntactic. So as we've been going along actually implementing this on our sides, we've discovered uh, cases where things are underspecified or like the ABNF is incorrect because ABNF is hard or you know things like this. And, and we've just sort of made a bunch of like, as you can sort of see here and actually on the next slide as well, um, uh, well please, <laughs> um, a bunch of sort of minor syntax changes which I think don't change the semantics uh, heavily. And so um, that's that's more or less that. We've been tracking the open issues on the... the, the mic, this complaints particularly through media, media go about the... Right, we're focus. coming through on the mic. Yeah. Oh, okay. And also the fuzz, it's pretty out of focus. Sorry, we're, we're, I didn't hear anything you said. You heard, you heard nothing I said like the whole time. No, you, oh, him. Oh, he was saying the mic wasn't working, so I was kind no, of uh, that, and also that the it's kind of out of focus. And it, on the next, on the other slide, it was particularly bad on the remote. Okay. Uh, so for people on the remote, I think the this, slides this, are available right online. Yeah. Yeah, the, and and the screenshots were just sort of like screenshots of the GitHub issues list, and I, I think, um, okay. you know, people who visit this URL can sort of see the the recent progress, um, but. Um, so that's that's like the really, I think I spent five minutes, right? That's like the five minute summary of sort of what we did between the last update at IETF 95. Um, I think nothing hugely surprising except for those sort of three fairly significant changes. Um, we have some, some open questions, which I think are um, also sort of, again, like sort of not changing the semantics dramatically, not changing the, the sort of deployment behavior dramatically, but maybe some some sort of like, stylistic questions. Um, the first is really this, this discussion of like the nested subdomain versus a, a single subdomain for hosting the policy. Um, we, we were kind of worried on the one hand about um, being able to use like a wildcard.example.org domain uh, signature, uh, certificate to sign the policy versus like the risk of say DynDNS or Tumblr, people who host untrusted subdomains having you know a persistent uh, service by somebody hosting a policy that's not legitimate. Um, so, so this was kind of one discussion we had whether we should host the HTTPS endpoint at you know policy.mta.sts.example.org versus just like a, a one-level uh, subdomain. 
I think we had some questions on the mailing list about how smart hosting should work. Um, to to me, and this is Victor's nodding. Um, so so to me, smart hosting is sort of you know you you just use the policy of the smart host uh, domain, not the not the original destination domain, and you're you're rewriting the the domain. But this is sort of the kind of operational stuff that I think um, maybe doesn't require uh, normative specifications, but is is kind of a little bit unclear in the spec today. Um, uh, similarly, somebody asked, should, should we allow HTTPS redirects on policy locations? So again, we sort of didn't specify this. I think it's quite reasonable. Obviously, you shouldn't be able to redirect from HTTPS to HTTP because that has no value, but um, sort of a, a reasonable question. Um, and, and then we had sort of a question about where the dot well-known policy should be and, and sort of how it makes deployment easier. So um, those are, I think, the four things I can think of recently which are sort of like likely to change or sort of noticeably going to change. Um, and, and then in terms of current efforts, so the Google policy is live and we expect uh, send time validation and logging and you know, eventually enforcement if it works uh, sometime this quarter. Um, Microsoft, I think the policy is like uh, half live or soon to be live and they're working on send time validation. Um, Comcast, the policy is live. The HTTPS endpoint has the wrong certificate right now, but that will be fixed very shortly. Um, and report only mode is planned. Yahoo, report only mode is planned. Um, one and one, I think report only mode is planned for a number of domains this summer. So we, we sort of know of a, a handful of big deployments. Most of them are people who contributed to the draft, which I think report only mode will happen in the near future for a lot of people. Enforcement will happen a little bit further off. Um, I don't know of other uh, other deployments, but there might be some. And um, that's basically the status. One more slide. Um, so TLS RPT, just to sort of cover that, because that was also supposed to be the topic here. Um. I yeah. I kind of think maybe we will stop here and take questions, clarifications, um, and hear from you what would you like from the working group to do. And particularly if we go to the list of open questions, it's three, yeah, back, yeah. Right. Yeah, this one. Can you actually go one more forward? This is Barry Liba. Yeah, I was being silly. Uh, this is Barry Leba. Uh, the I see this is uh, no the the next slide. Yeah, I see this as a nice list. I see it's there's nothing. There's no implementation section in the document. I suggest that you put that in so that when the document is reviewed, everyone can see the the running code that's out there. You do you mean see code that on GitHub or something? Or no, 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 no. The, the, see see who, who's actually working on it. Who is I implementing see. this? There, there's um there's, what. There, there's a there's a, a document that used to be an experimental. Now it's BCP that suggests that mm. we put implementation section, okay. implementation considerations, or implementation yeah. report, or whatever it's called. And I suggest you do that. Okay. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Hi, from Jim Fenton. Uh, what deployment is there beyond publications of records, e.g., in MTAs? So, um, in terms of uh, send time validation, I mean, we at Google we anticipate we'll have send time validation working this quarter. Um, I think a number of our other sort of co-authors and partners expect to have uh, maybe offline report-only implementations like this summer, this quarter. Um, I think one reasonable question would be when and whether we'll have uh, an implementation in an open source MTA like Postfix that people can use. Um, I, I, I would actually like to contribute open source code that does validation, but I don't know if I have the time to do that. So. So uh, in Postfix, probably nothing before uh, Victor Dukovny. In Postfix, probably nothing before the spec is finalized, um, and perhaps even though the outline, you know, at a very high level, the spec is not too bad. The details need a great deal of work. Um, so if we think that O1 is near a final draft, I think we'll see probably an O5 before it's really done. Um, uh, one obvious example that actually we neglected to pay attention to is that the ID field probably needs multiple values. Um, otherwise, you can't do rollover of IDs reliably. Uh, so we this is right. this is actually the, um, the right. on the previous slide question right. four. Um, uh, so so Nico's suggestion around this was actually just right. to move the hosting to the ID in the URI, and that way you can sort of do rollover easily. But but it's a um, right. It, I think this is the same issue. It's no, because a, if you reasonable. introduce a new policy, there is not yet in DNS caches an ID that matches it. Um, and when people retrieve the policy, 
um, it, the, the IDs won't match and they'll keep retrieving the policy over and over again, but their cache will say that it's the wrong ID. Anyway, we can talk about that offline. Um, so the, the, the ID field needs revision. Uh, the entire future section is either impractical or irrelevant, needs to be deleted, uh, but we can again discuss that on the list. <laughs> Uh, the uh, state machine is underspecified, needs to be expanded to take into account multiple MX hosts. Uh, there are some editorial issues about just how the, the motivation in terms of comparisons of Dane and this, that not so much by advocating for Dane, but I think need clarification. They, some of the descriptions are a little off. Yeah, I mean, I and think so, I would so focus on the a bunch of work here. Like the, the state machine and the, the sort of deployment issues are the ones I'd focus on, because I think those right. are the ones where you can really tell us, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, I mean, I think right. th these are issues where you're likely to discover maybe different implementation issues than we are. Um, certainly, I think I think the normal usage of Postfix looks very different than the normal deployment of an MDA at Google. Um, and I, I don't necessarily have as much insight as you do into sort of the former. So, um, you know, I, I'd rather uh, not do four more revisions before I get all the Postfix feedback. I'd actually rather get the feedback sooner if it's possible. Um, that doesn't mean you have to implement it and tell us what we're being stupid about, you know, now. But like I, I do think the sooner that we have that working open source implementation in sort of smaller deployments, the sooner we would get that feedback and we wouldn't have to do the four more revisions, right? Dan York, Internet Society. So it just can you just talk me through the, the Dane, uh, the coexistence that you mentioned? Right. So um, we don't make any real statements. I mean, I think aside from sort of a mention, as Victor was saying, that there are other systems out there, we don't really make any statements sure. about how it should relate. Um, the, the, the coexistence that I would imagine is, you, you know, on send time, you can certainly validate both. Um, I think we had some discussion on the mailing list of, uh, about, you know, potentially if, if you validate Dane, you don't bother as a sender to validate SDS, which I think is quite reasonable. Sure. Um, I don't really okay. think we need to make a statement, right? But it's sort of if, if you're sending mail, you obviously can check one and say, okay, you know, DNSSEC checks out. It's probably good. Um, right. If so there's... It becomes more of a policy decision that the yeah. sending MTA makes. Right. So I think at send time, it's a policy decision on part of the sending MTA. We can certainly. Right. Wait, wait. So not wait. Victor. Victor, you got We got remote people. So okay, sorry. Um, STS downgrades the security of Dane. So if it's a kind of more ubiquitous but less secure option, if Dane exists, it really needs to be authoritative. I think. I think the way I saw it, I don't think that this is how we saw it, and I might be missing something. The way I saw it, if you're sending MTA, you might reasonably say, if STS fails, fail the message. If Dane fails, fail the message, which I think would be reasonable. No, but if STS says soft, yeah. right. um, okay. if STS says soft fail, right. uh, you right. that Dane. was exactly Yeah, that was exactly my point earlier with why we got rid of the, the, the Dane references, right? I think that the way we had it before was this sort of bad state Victor's talking about where we said, um, if STS says soft fail, but authenticate with Dane, like what, what do you do? You're sort of circumventing Dane. So we don't have that now. I think now it's, as you were saying, it's essentially a, a sender policy question. Okay. As a sender, what I would do if I were validating both Dane and SDS is I would fail if either one of them fails. As a recipient, you can certainly publish both. Um, you may not want to, you might want to, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, any more comments, questions? And, I mean, we can walk through the open issues more, but I think they're sort of yeah, better to so, the list. Yeah. Right. So what we're trying to do here, or what I heard from the authors they're trying to do is um, to get as much as possible feedback from the implementers um, in order to, to polish basically the text and the protocol and the system. Um, and uh, as you saw, the companies are implementing it. And so it would be great to get this feedback, uh, you know, as soon as possible. Um, and uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, from Mark Richard, do any of the attendees know of other implementations beyond those that were on the slide? Do you have a second? Please, Mike. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Ten lines up. Ten lines. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Sorry. Which one? Can't see it. Oh yeah. Is there? A, oh, is there an exim implementation underway? There is. There, oh, there is an exim implement. <laughs> I can't read. There is an exim implementation on the way. Do attendees know of any other implementations? Exim. Exim. I've heard of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you know, Mark's saying the same thing. We would 
much rather have some working open source implementation that we could get some feedback from. And I, I think I think the thing that's really obviously missing from our perspective is just what it looks like to be deploying Postfix or XM for a small domain where you have maybe a backup MX hosted by somebody else and, and you know these kinds of things. And I'd, I'd really like to invite people to sort of do that and give us feedback earlier. I'm looking specifically at Victor. <laughs> right, so, um, so in post six, we tend to not implement anything that can't be done 100% right. Uh, so uh, it'll take a while for us to be convinced that this can be done 100% right. In particular, you know, the timeouts for HTTP are underspecified here. What are recommendations there uh, and the like? So lots of things have to be pinned down. We have to be convinced that it scales with post should, should and all the error conditions are right. I mean, for examples like that, should we have, I, I think we shouldn't have normative specifications for what the timeout should be for the uh, SMTP specifies normative. We? Well, sorry, the recommended timeouts at, at least, and, and I, okay. I don't remember whether it's a must or a should. Perhaps it's a should, but it's still normative. Okay. Uh, SMTP says that 300 seconds at least for mail from recipient to and so on timeouts, 600 for, you know, dot. Okay. And, and you, I mean, you think the normative content. spec should be that specific on yes, like, okay. uh, so that one can reasonably understand what the expectations are on the sending and receiving side. Um, the uh, the other thing is that uh, my experience with XM is that they tend to stop short of dotting all the i's and crossing all the t's. Uh, so they 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 have a Dane implementation, but it's a bit incomplete, um, and they they think they're done, but you know, okay. not entirely. <laughs> uh, and even though I donated code to them, they haven't finished the proper integration yet. Um, so yeah, XM may be done, but it may not be secure yet. You know, who knows? I'm sorry to shame them in public a little bit, but, uh, you know, that, that's kind of how it goes. So, you know, it's not really done until somebody's reviewed it, and I don't know who's going to do yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I do think we're sort of circling around this issue of, like, how to, how to get the feedback that's that kind of detailed feedback, right? But and This is Barry Lieber. So wait, there are six documents defining HTTP and how it works. And are you really saying that you want this document to give that kind of HTTP detail? Uh, I don't think that's appropriate. I think this points to those and say, that's how you do HTTP, and here's how you do this with HTTP. Right, but uh, this is Victor again. But if I'm uh, blocking on an HTTP request in, in the middle of an email transaction, uh, then uh, I have to have some notion as to what's appropriate in this space. Uh, I don't know what timeouts HTTP does or doesn't specify. Maybe it leaves the issue entirely open. Mm. Uh, but if I'm to have a scalable MTA, I need to know what's expected of me because the person provisioning the HTTP infrastructure might plan it for a certain scale and might expect people to wait a certain amount before they get serviced. Uh, yeah. And they ought to know that they should monitor for responses within the certain budget that the RFC recommends or else you know, email will start breaking. Um, and MTAs, you know, with lim limited concurrency, Postfix tries to not overwhelm the machine it's running on. It but runs it within a certain concurrency. Like very, if, like if, if, specific. Right. But if latency gets out of whack, we, we can't deliver mail to the domain. Right. I mean, these are these are all like really reasonable implementation comments. I think I'm I'm sort of I am sort of surprised that we would want to go to that level of specificity about yeah things like I mean we we take for granted that you can find a working secure HTTPS client because you know you should be able to right and. Like I, I think specifying that level of detail is sort of not not totally appealing to me. Both because yeah, I think the RFCs exist for that already, and because I think the whole value proposition of what we're doing is you can already like get URL lib, tell it to validate certificates, and sort of not worry about it, right? Hopefully, maybe maybe not. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that this is like a reasonable question if you're sending from Postfix and you want to know how long you should block. But that seems sort of to me like something that you would just as you're, you know, as the Postfix author, you would sort of like figure out, maybe I'm being optimistic. So this is Barry. Um, what I will agree with Victor on is that if you find that the normal way HTTP is used isn't sufficient for this, then it probably is reasonable to say, for this environment, here are different parameters that you need to use. But I think before you go sticking that in the document, we need to have some idea that that's really necessary yeah. for this use case. And we wouldn't want that to be the case. I mean, as right. you were saying, the value, the, the value proposition is not to do that, I think. 
Okay, great. It seems like when we had great discussion here, it seems we did no discussion to follow on the list. Uh, we would like to ask actually who in the audience, how to, to judge how many people in the audience actually read this latest draft? Okay, no, actually it's sort, yeah, at least sort of the audience. Great, that's great. Um, Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so this was about the first draft. The second draft is about reporting, um, which is just one side up. And um, do do I have to say more than this? I mean, I think I think the reporting is uh, very simple. And like I said, I, I sort of expect mostly uncontroversial. Um, We have a comment from uh, Kurt Anderson. Uh, normal, what's normal for interactive web traffic is not necessarily normal. The, the needs for a high performance MTA. Okay. So is is that true? I think uh, web web latency is user facing, and uh, mail send latency is not really user facing. So is that? Uh, I I said something. I said. <laughs> Uh, Ted, Ted Hardy, uh, actually, what I was going to point out here is that there, there are going to be a bunch of different uh, deployment considerations that will be different in different environments. So, for example, in, in a case where you have uh, a long-lived uh, HTTP connection where you're going to use the keep alive parameter, there's a timeout um, associated with that where you can uh, tell um, the, the other party how long uh, the connection should be available for. You can always keep it open longer. Um, that won't be the, the case in all of these connections, right? That you, you have uh, a persistent connection available. I, I think specifying it for all MTAs in all deployments would be startling. Um, you might have some advice that says, hey, um, please, please consider this in making the engineering trade-offs of how, you're, how long you're willing to wait. If you've got a very high performance MTA, uh, you might uh, wait a shorter amount of time before moving moving on than if you've got uh, one that's basically got a, a persistent connection to mm -hmm. one or a very small number of hosts. Um, writing that as deployment considerations with the engineering trade-offs for different conditions makes sense to me. Standardizing on, mm -hmm. on a particular set um, would be surprising behavior. This is Barry. Yes, what Ted said. And in response to... <clears throat> Yeah, something that's user facing, you want it to be quick, but the user can tolerate a few second mm -hmm. delay before he sees something. Uh, when your MTA has to transmit a million messages a minute, you can't tolerate a few second delay. Sure, sure yeah. I mean, if you were looking up the policy for, you know, a, a different domain per message, which I mean, which could happen, I think it would be potentially very, very expensive. Even if one lookup delays you by Locked a few queue. seconds, you've started to build up a queue yeah. that may take yeah. you a while to, to, fi to fix. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I agreed with that. I think I think two questions about this. One is I think this goes a bit to the comment of, you know, these are different trade-offs or different deployments. Um, I think it would be hard to, to say sort of normatively what, what trade-off you should make. Um, I guess the other question I have is, is, is this a, a, a situation where the policy host needs to be understanding that trade-off on part of sort of most senders? Like, it, is it the case that if I deploy my policy on a relatively slow HTTPS endpoint, it will be a big problem for people who have a uh, short message, you know, can't tolerate a long message queue? And, and if that's the case, then yeah, maybe we want to say, take this into consideration. People may have trouble delivering to, their, to your domain <laughs> if the policy fetch takes a while. Uh, Ted Hardy, I, I absolutely agree that um, taking it into account on both sides of it is, is, is perfectly reasonable, but we also have to uh, acknowledge that the system must be at least reasonably ro robust to delay uh, mm -hmm. simply because there, there are delays built into the, the layer below TCP, I mean the layer below comma TCP, um, and um, there, there's always the possibility that after you've done the TCP handshake you get something like a routing change mm -hmm. um, that that causes this to take longer than you expect, right? So um, the, a reasonable amount of robustness to variation in this is also uh, part of what the system has to have. And I, I think describing what what the the variations can be is useful in making making people aware of what the engineering right. trade-offs are, but, but really demanding it of, of the internet system is not going to work well. Sorry, uh, Aurit specifically asked about 
TLS report. One thing is that a piece of what should go in TLS report is currently still in the STS spec draft. And that is the uh, registrations of the deep things are really report specific. They are living in the wrong draft at the moment. Which, uh, uh, there's a section which, seven or something or whatever in the, in the STS draft that's really a whole bunch of uh, verbs or attributes, whatever, that describe failure modes that really okay, belong had, in the reporting because they're not STS specific. Yeah, that, it, I, uh, man, so no, that I no longer move. remember this, so I, right. I, can't, I can't sort of speak to it. Uh, we, we had made an effort to sort of generalize the errors. Right. And that's actually one of the points here is we had, I think, originally said, oh, we can come up with a taxonomy of ways in which TLS connections fail. And then we have a nice sort of schema here. And we realized you sort of can't do that. I mean, you could sort of do it for OpenSSL in general cases because a lot of people right. use it. But you can't really do this in the general case, I think. Well, and I mean, but so, you have specific things. They right, just belong so, in the report draft, just moving well, over. We, we were inclined to saying it might be an editorial error, because we sort of made the effort, I think, mostly to remove, as I recall, to remove sort of specific. I mean, is it still, still in there? Okay, I'm, okay, I'm, okay. I'm wrong. Um, so that's still like, there. It needs to move. Um, um, the other thing is to maybe finish off the topic. The, the main reason I want to, th to think about timeouts is that if they're long, Mm -hmm. recommended to be by default, you know, give, be generous to the HTTP server. Then that might change the design in terms of whether you recommend that the mm -hmm. MTA proceed to send and, you know, fetch right. policy in the background and, you know, later this was my future question about, messages might benefit from the policy, yeah. but the one you're currently sending just acts as a right. probe to trigger it, or whether in fact the or current message should block, should block and, yeah, yeah. but then that message stalls for the recommended duration. You know, these issues all this, this interact. Question, I, sort of, I, I think it, it matters insofar as it changes. Design decisions by the policy host change some decisions around the sender, as, as you were describing. And I, th I think it's sort of worth describing how we expect it to happen to, to reach some consensus there. Yeah, John Levine, the TLS reporting stuff is still kind of underspecified. Like if you say, like it says, if it says mail to you, it says mail it, but are you supposed to like send the JSON in the body of the message or is it an attachment or is it a compressed attachment like it is in DMARC? And the other thing is, um, I, we understand this is not the same as DMARC, but in DMARC, third parties collecting reports turned out to be really useful, which meant that you needed some way to publish the mm -hmm. fact that domain A is willing to get reports yeah. for domain B, so you need to stick that in. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've read this, it's like, I think we left it out because it was complicated. And like, but doing it the exact same way as DMARC is reasonable and sort of has the right security trade-offs, I think. So it turns out not to be that complicated. So. So I don't see any any people at the mic. Um, so I will try to kind of summarize the points, um, and tell me if if it's correct. Um, so the first one, it seems to me that um, there is a lot of a tuning of parameters that is is going to be i mean will will need to be done and probably this is this is going to be based even on the implementation experience going forward but basically that's that's one area um, and um what else i mean i think regarding that like i'm i i am not still entirely sure how to proceed in the sense that, yeah, I think some of that will be very implementation dependent. Um, and, and some of that, like the degree of specificity, I think we're not all, I don't, I don't know, that, I think Victor wants to be more specific than I do, for example. Um, and, and I'm sort of not sure quite where the middle ground is there. Um, right, so I, I think some of that is still- Okay, so, so, so it's kind of, um, you know, maybe it's two issues. One is the tuning of parameters. Yeah. And the other one is the specificity yeah, of yeah. state machine and stuff and exactly. actually explain how it all works. Um, and then, so these two kind of we discussed and identified. Do we see any additional issues that you would like to get, that you are stuck with basically, you as, as the team of authors, uh, that you would like feedback for, or you have enough homework? I'm sort of looking at my call to do. I, mean, I, I think no. Um, okay, I, that's I'm good. sure we'll discover stuff as we implement, but. Not at this point. Okay, and uh, and you feel that you do have enough homework to do for the next revision? I think so. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, Chris Newman just wanted to mention that you know uh, there's a, su a a set of tasks related to aligning MUA and MTA STS. Uh, I'll I'll talk about those yeah, more yeah, in my presentation, but. Uh, um, 
uh, I, um, I should be on the hook to review the, the reporting spec in detail uh, to make sure that it applies to both protocols. So uh, keep me on the hook for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Will do. Dean York, uh, and I have read the draft and, and looking through that. I, I just, I think as I looked at this before, but now I'm seeing again, you're still relying on, on a trust and first use, right? You're still, yeah. it's still some mechanism that the attacker could disrupt that before they get to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're still, I think the security considerations could spell that out, maybe even use that term because we're using that, you know, within the, the, the space of that. Um, yeah. I saw the future work pieces were looking at how to mitigate yeah. that or how yeah. to do that in some way. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, I think it's exactly the same semantics as HSDS, for example, right? Yeah. I think I think we'd be happy. For example, one very easy thing that we could do, sort of off the bat, is like a preload list, which I, I think is is reasonable. You know, have a have a bundled set of policies that ship with your MTA, right? Um, longer term, we sort of describe things. You know, public key pinning. Uh, cert transparency, so you can sort of have a. a, a well, sure. This is also space where you know, working uh, with DNSSEC for people who publish, you know, their, yeah. if their MX records are signed through that and the validation is occurring, then you know that you're getting that. And then those two, it's a space where they can work together because yeah. at that point, you know, you have the correct MX records, or the correct, uh, and and you can be able to connect to the correct sites. So okay. Yeah. Uh, just for the record, I don't believe that either public key pinning or certificate transparency have any chance of being applicable here. That's why I talked about the feature section should be largely deleted. Uh, I don't know if this is the time to really delve into detail. People, how much time do people have? Um, uh, are I'm you interested there, in so some exposition of this? Or I mean, I'm, I'm curious. You can email yeah. me later. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead? OK. Um, so certificate transparency relies on the log servers being able to distinguish between completely made up gibberish reports and reports that actually are true observations because the certificate chains are signed. Uh, in here, the only party that's able to validate the signature is the client that connects to the server. Where we don't have a signed piece of data, we have a signed transmission channel in the form of, of HTTPS. So if I observe a particular policy, there's no way I can convey to the log that I observed a valid policy. The log cannot be convinced by me reporting it. And so the log can be spammed into irrelevance the attackers can fill the log with so much gibberish mm -hmm. that you won't be able to tell the good from the bad. And this is a fatal obstacle to getting CT working in this space. So for example, I don't think that CT really can mm -hmm. work here in the same way that it can work for X509. With, without having uh, signed policies served. Right. As, as so your CA logic. would have to right. then be involved in signing your policies, yeah. which, you know, hey, you can you go could, there. You could do, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, but I don't think you're likely to, to it's, really it's want the CA yeah, to start issuing signed uh, MTA policies and have to wait for them to issue you a signature for your policy before you can deploy it. So the serious issue is there. If you really want to think about it, no, it's, it's, it's unlikely to fly. Um, as for pinning, uh, in many a deployment, if you want to not absolutely pin down the names of your MX hosts, so you would say star.example.com, yeah then the attacker merely can substitute another MX host. Uh, for example, no, I, I, I meant, I meant key pinning, but yeah. No, uh, key pinning, the key pinning is MX per host because different hosts will have different keys. Yeah. So if, if I pin the key for MX1 and MX2.example.com, the attacker, the man in the middle attacker, will say at this moment, the uh, MX hosts are MX3. And the client will say, great, correct MX host. And you know the policy matches, he'll use a certificate that, you know, uh, it's a CA, you know, everything checks no, out. I don't, uh, but so, pinning, pinning is supposed to prevent the CA being right, able right. to. No, so, so you can pin, obviously, farther up the, 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 the uh, signature. You can, you can, can say that CA. all this the MS MTAs the, have to have the same. Right. This the doesn't same solve the trust and first usage. I mean, it's sort of orthogonal. To the no, no, but, but what I'm saying is that the, the attacker can shift. If, if you pin um, uh, across all the MTAs, Yes, you might get some protection. There's, of course, many people right. and, and I are skeptical attacker. that this is actually practical. It'll break as often as it works. But right. I'm, I'm literally pinning because of the issue. But, but in many cases, the, the pinning across all the MTAs isn't viable because people get different sorts of different MTAs. There'll be backup MX hosts and the like. And so pinning works rather poorly. We shouldn't expect it to be 
a savior why, in why the, would you uh, I mean, backup know, you know, yeah, I, you know, anyway. I remember him saying that oh, already works very poorly for HSTS. And I think it's even offers think, weaker protection for, for, for SMTP. Well, it's, it's not, it's not related to because the, of the indirection the issue anyway. So it's, it's sort of off, right. Off, but off, anyway, off uh, so I think, I think the very much on both. The list is very easy, for example. Um, I think, I think past that point, you know. Okay. Great discussion. <laughs> um, so I guess, yeah, we're done All here. Right. We're good. Um, Thank you, Dan. I think we have a lot of feedback. Thank you guys. That's great. <laughs> uh, so now we are going to Chris. who will provide update on his draft. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, this is the, I've, I've renamed the deep drafts title, not the draft name yet, yet but the title to SDS for MUAs to make, to help align these proposals since they are doing the similar thing. Um, moving on, uh, yeah, this is my overview slide. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, for the protocol, but, uh, that's, uh, you know, no big changes here, so we can move forward. So here's the key changes in the new draft. Um, I've changed the terminology, uh, uh, and I've also changed to using the term directives, which is the term that HSTS uses for, you know, for what I was calling, you know, security keys and, and latches. And so... Just so I've switched to directives for that. Um, I've changed the protocol syntax to the key with optional value syntax that HSTS uses. Uh, and I've, I removed the, DS, the DSN header as, you know, if we want that, it belongs in the MTA relay SDS document. Um, so we should have a discussion of if we want to just drop that feature altogether or, or or just take that text and stuff it in the in the correct document, um, and then and then a bunch of edit, editorial work, um, more you know more details on that in the draft. Uh, so next slide. So yeah, the big issue that's open on this is alignment of the MUA and MTA SDS specs. Uh, so I think I've moved forward on this by changing. You know, you know, by changing the terminology, um, but you know, I just want to, you know, but I, I, I think it's important to align these because email technology is already very complicated. So we want to uh, avoid adding more complexity than necessary to email. So the the closer these are to being this, uh, to sharing appropriate technology, you know, they're not there very different use cases for F STS. So you can't, they're, you know, they need to be separate specs. They are separate proposals, but there, there is appropriate technology to share. So uh, next slide. Um, so roughly what I would start, uh, you yeah, know, the starting point for a alignment proposal is, so I, I've started turning the registry that was in deep into a directive registry for STS in general. Uh, that would cover MUA, MTA, and HSTS. Um, so it, it would be one registry for all of them, kind of like the email header, or like the header registry covers HTTP and email headers. So it would be a shared registry along those lines where the items in the registry say what protocol those items apply to. Um, question, you know, question I'm unsure about is, you know, do, should we have a preferred directive syntax? Now, right now, the, the current STS draft, I believe it's using JSON for the directives and HSTS is using HTTP parameter value syntax, which is, you know, key, key option, optional value with semicolon delimiter and and so I went mostly to copying the HTTP syntax, but um, it turns out if you allow double quotes around the value, that screws up. It, you know that then it doesn't slot into into the MUA protocol. So I, I removed that from the syntax. The question is: Is syntax alignment matter, or do we just want to say, okay, these are abstract key with optional value, and then the syntax for your protocol is protocol specific? Uh, do people have an opinion on that? 
I damn regardless again. Um, so I don't care about the syntax, obviously. Um, I don't write parsers. I use parser libraries somebody else wrote, so I think it doesn't matter too much. The 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 registry, like my my larger question on this is do we think that there are items in the registry which are shared or um, are they entirely disjoint sets? So the one I know of that shared is MaxAge is shared by M MTASTS and HSTS. That MaxAge is shared. Um, yeah. That may be the only one in the initial set. Um, but you know, is that it, it, is that a problem? I mean, I, I think like I, I hate to say this because it makes me sound like I don't want to sort of have code reuse or, or spec reuse. But then my question is, if that's the only thing that's shared, uh, you know, what advantages are in a shared registry? Um, well, the separate registries, then each document has to define its own registry and describe the registration mm -hmm. process and have its own expert reviewer and, and you know, go through the whole IETF review process or IANA review process to create the registry. And so there's, there's a certain amount of overhead to creating a, a, an IANA registry and I'm trying to share that overhead. That, 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 that's why I'm leaning towards a common registry, but you know, I'm not firmly in that direction. So, Dave, Dave Crocker, um, there it seems to me there should be an overriding sense that these are reasonable to keep together, and um, the whole point behind a registry is extensibility. There could be more header headers or headers or header fields. Right, right. So I. I think I have it on the next slide, but I, I, pr I proposed an expert review model for the registry. So, so uh, as long as there is an overriding sense that it makes sense for these to be together, that, that in the, over the long haul, there's a fair amount of overlap and very likely sharing of entries, even if there's only one right now, then it would make sense to have only one. Having them be separate creates the problem that should there be sharing, you've just created a whole lot more work and the opportunity for uh, becoming di uh, divergent. Right, I think the reality is somewhere in the middle of those two positions. I don't think there's a strong case that, uh, there's a hugely strong case for sharing them, but I think there there is there is a an example of overlap, so. So I lean towards sharing them right now. Uh, for Sean Leonard, uh, as a parser writer, reuse is good. And for security, uh, reusing constructs that have already been analyzed uh, would help to lead to fewer implementation errors. So also for sharing. Sorry, Dan Margolis again. What, what are some examples of extensions that we would want to add in the future? So I think for Deep, it's, it's more obvious to me because you're um, you know, you're you're trying to provide security constructs which might rely on other, you know, other primitives in the future. For for STS, um, I mean, we we might, but I think STS almost is the primitive, and so the, the extensibility case is less clear to me. Um, well, I mean, HSTS had the same situation where they, you know, when they published it, they didn't think there was any extensibility, and there's already a. Uh, what, what uh, there's already a limited use extension to HSTS out in the wild. Um, uh, that uh, so, you know, my my thinking is, you know, is we've already we've we've already seen an example where an extension is needed. Let's just, you know, I've already written most of the registry work. All I need to do is split this out into a separate draft. We 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 reference it. We're done. Um, uh, I don't I think I directly can comment on whether the registry should be joined or not, but I just want to say that the uh, STS registry is, is really the report registry, not the STS registry. The bulk of the terms there apply equally to any MTA to MTA right. report. Right, those need to be separate registries. The, 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 as, you know, the STS directive registry is separate from the reporting registry. Right. The, the, those, do, you know, those are clearly separate functions. Um, um, let's see. Okay, so uh, uh, oh, I had one more bullet on the previous slide. Um, the the other area where we need to talk about alignment is reporting mechanisms. So right now, the MUA STS has an in-band reporting mechanism, and SMTP STS has that out-of-band reporting mechanism that was just split out into a shared spec. Um, so. Uh, 
I, I think it's interesting to share the out-of-band reporting mechanism between both proposals. So if there's no objections to moving in that direction, then I'll, I'm on the hook to review the, the out-of-band reporting mechanism and, and, and you know, to make sure it, it has the features that I think MUAs need for reporting. Uh, and conversely, I was advocating stronger for the other direction, uh, strongly, uh, to share the in-band reporting mechanism as much as possible. I'd like to see one for STS and Dane. So if you're willing to write up or with me to write up a common in-band mechanism, that'd be super. Um, so the, there is an in-band mechanism in the MUA STS draft right now. Uh, oh God, I really don't want to edit, ed edit a third draft, but is that the right thing to do is split that out into a third draft that we both reference? And it would be kind of, and I think it would actually be a non-normative reference, which would be the nice thing about it. Right, so I, I think, time my rolls again. Um, on the, on the in-band, um, I definitely don't see a downside to having you know, a different error code for like, I mean, for server-to-server -server SNTP, if you say I terminated the connection because of a TLSA failure, I, I think it's quite reasonable to have a, a different quick code for that. Um, I think presumably that's a different draft. Um, both in-band and out-of-band seem to me to be useful and conceivably you would implement both. So, you know. Okay, it looks like a call for a joint work here. Yeah, it, very specific. It, it looks like there's, there's leaning towards both. So, okay, more work for me. Uh, there we go. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's a good. That's a would, would anyone be willing to co-edit the um, the inbound reporting mechanism? Uh, yeah. That would be that would be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, may the minutes note that Victor volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> so <nice. laughs> okay. Uh, the shared STS registry. Um, I, I was noting most of the directives are protocol specific because these three use cases are quite different. You know, in, you know the semantics are just so different between the use case, even though it, it really is the same function we're, we're performing, uh, same core function. Um, I'm not sure I have a clear view on whether we should share syntax or not yet. Um, <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I, I feel if people are already deploying code with the JSON syntax, maybe we shouldn't change. Um, but uh. so, so actually on this topic, it, it's kind of two questions here. Um, the obvious question that we always ask how many people read the draft, but also how many people actually implemented something from, from your draft? I think that's the question that you need to ask. Well, I mean, I just changed the syntax incompatibly, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in, so in, in my draft, so there you go. Um, okay. I mean, it also has the warning, don't implement yet at the top. Correct. Because I, you know, I, I believe in you know, reaching the point where I think it's done before I remove that warning. Um, the uh, uh, so you need to decide. I'm quickly. looking for more guidance on whether or not to share a syntax, <laughs> and I'm not hearing anything. Um, Do you have a sense of sort of how many people are lined up? I, I know this is putting you on the spot, but how many people are lined up to implement this, or what the what the sort of seeing it in production timeline would be? Uh, on MUA SDS, I, I don't have a clear sense of uh, 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 that. I, I mean, that's a fair question. No, I don't have a clear sense right now for the timeline. I mean, it's been, an, you know, I've been working on the spec for longer, but, you know, there you go. Um, okay. The well, I, I really think you need to ask this question on the list because in the past we, we heard some voices, people saying they're implementing something of it. Uh, so. Okay. We will ask it on. The, I mean, please ask it again on the list, and we and you will get a better sense. Okay, so why don't I go ahead with the assumption that we're not sharing syntax since we're not right now, uh, and and that's less change. Um, 
And, and, and then if, if somebody has a strong feeling that syntax should be shared, we can, we can address that when that comes up. Um, the other thing about the shared registry is I, I'm proposing it be expert review and that there be a limited use flag. You either, it's either common use or limited use for a registry entry. So basically the expert review bar for a limited use entry would be much lower because you know, there's always the tension in a registry between collision avoidance and, um, where you, where you want to make it easy to register and and clear semantics where you want to make it hard to register so the semantics of what it means are clear and so i like the limited use flag as the compromise between those two and we already have one example of limited use that uh will be registered in the hsts space after this is published so um so that's why that flag's there. Uh, so that's that's it for the shared registry, I think. Uh, the areas where we're, drafts are not aligning, um, MTA, SCS, uh, sorry, it's just HTTPS now. Uh, drop, uh, pretend the DNS sec wasn't there. Um, <laughs> uh, well, MUA, SCS uses in-band TLS. You know, th that's, they're just different on how that works. The, uh, MTA relay and HSTS use match max age and the MUA SDS. We decided not to use that. Um, and then other directives are protocol specific. So this is where the protocols don't align. Uh, I think that's, is that my last slide? I think it is. Yep. Yep. Okay. Any other comments on MUA SDS? Okay, I'll try to turn around a couple revisions as quickly as I can to uh, to get this done. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so now we are ready for our remote presenter. Good luck to us. Jim, you should step up to the um, to the meet echo too. So, uh, Jim, if you're uh... Jim, if you're listening to the um, remote um, stream, you should yeah, you should um, step up to the Meet Echo a microphone now, and I will. Oh, yeah. He's learning. He's learning the system. Oh, trying to figure out. Yeah. 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 All right. While there's an interlude, is Alexi here? Oh, there you are. So, so um, Alexi Melikov is one of the art IDs, and Alexi knows like crap loads more about email than I do. Uh, so we thought it might make sense to swap kind of the responsible ID for the working group at some point in the near future, I guess. Um, so we chatted about it with the chairs. It doesn't make any real difference, but just so you know, and are not shocked or surprised or anything, but Alexi will be the uh, responsible helper as opposed to me from sometime near in the future. Oh yeah. So let's see if I'm, pr let's see what happens if I press this. That means that you get to talk, Jim. Hi, can you hear me all right? Oh yeah. Oh hey, good, it works. I finally found the right button on, on Meet Echo. So uh, are, my, are my slides up in the room there? Yeah, your intro slide is up. Just tell me when to flip and I'll try to give you feedback on what's showing. Okay, uh, bear with me just a sec. I was busy with Meet Echo and I need to figure out how to uh, get my slides so I can see them here as well. So it'll take a second. Here we go. All right, so um, I don't have a whole lot to report on require TLS uh, this time around. Um, I, I presented it, I think, fairly extensively uh, down in uh, Buenos Aires. And um, I uh, uh, hope people remember that, but I have some backup slides if, if people uh, would like me to represent some of, some of that. Uh, it's a different approach to um, uh, applying uh, stronger requirements 
on TLS uh, transport for uh, SMTP, where this comes from the sending side rather than a policy that's published by the uh, uh, by the recipient side. So rather than um, uh, having some sort of a policy record that's published, uh, this is basically a tag that goes along. It's on a on a very fine grained basis. It's it's uh, message by message, and the um, um, uh, the essentially that 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 tag follows along and um, uh, essentially makes sure that uh, both require TLS and uh, uh, the re TLS with the the proper characteristics uh, are are used whenever the message is is forwarded onward. So uh, please go on to uh, I think it's slide two review problem statement. You're in. Okay. So the the problem that I'm that I'm trying to solve here is that TLS is opportunistic. Now that's often uh, what you would really like to have happen. You want email to be delivered. That's kind of the postal uh, paradigm. Um, uh, deliver the mail whenever you can. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what that means in in practice here is that if you can't negotiate start TLS, you basically send the message without start TLS. If you can't uh, verify the the uh, uh, server certificate, you basically note the fact that it failed, and you and you send that and send the message anyway. But this is often what you want, but it's not always what you want. There are times when you want to send a sensitive message. Uh, there are times, in particular, where you would like additional protection for uh, even the uh, the header information, the envelope information that are not protected by end-to-end uh, -end, uh, encryption. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, think of a, a foreign correspondent that's uh, uh, sending a, um, something from a, a war zone or something like that. There might be situations where uh, they, uh, they want to make sure that that message uh, either is sent securely or isn't sent at all. So go on to the next slide. Um, and so I, I missed the I missed the cutoff for the internet draft. I do have a have a revision uh, kind of in the works, uh, but I, I kind of felt that since I missed the cutoff, it's inappropriate for me to try and present a new revision here. But uh, be looking for one. I, I just kind of wanted to let everybody know that I'm I'm still still working on this. Uh, I do I have been advised that there is one uh, commercial MTA that is planning to do uh, an implementation of this. Uh, so we'll have something to test it with, uh, you know, since it's one MTA, probably not in terms of interoperability, but at least in terms of effectiveness. Um, and uh, if there are any questions or if there's a sense whether I should go back and give a quick review of what require TLS is, I'd be happy to do that. Question: I remember on the list there was some discussion. This is Victor Dukhovny. I remember on the list there was some discussion as to whether the thing should be very specific as to the properties of required TLS and mandate ciphers and all kinds of things, or in order to be usable, be much looser and sort of allow these things to be uh, underspecified. And I don't know that we reached consensus on that one. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that there probably should be a converse specification in which you say, no, my mail, in fact, has nothing of any sensitivity at all, but damn well deliver it even if there's STS or Dane because it's time sensitive. Uh, so in addition to require TLS spec, we might want to say a fuck TLS spec, if I can say so, <laughs> or whatever, uh, and just send, send, send the torpedoes, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's interesting. So I agree, we haven't reached consensus about how specific uh, required TLS should be. Um, I'm essentially not planning on making any uh, on making any changes right now, uh, pending you know some more some more discussion on that topic. Um, the you know a lot of the changes that uh, that I wanted to to describe were things about you know kind of the motivation and and, and deployment. Uh, and probably less on the on the uh, details of the protocol. Um, the uh, <laughs> that that's an amusing suggestion to write a a, a fuck TLS specification. Uh, I don't think I'm the person to write that one. <laughs> All right, was that it? 
that was all I had, unless people would like a review of what Require TLS is. All right. Um, let me actually ask who who here in the room has uh, read the required TLS, the at least the last draft. Oh, a couple of people, a fair number of people. Um, so it doesn't. I don't know if anybody feels they want an introduction to the topic. Um, there, there's there's one hand for introduction. I don't know if that counts. Nah, I you know you you can get that offline, Ola. Um, Oh, yeah, feel I, free I to contact me if, if anybody yeah. wants a, 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 a yeah. one-off yeah. uh, intro. So um, we got questions at the mic. Ole Johansson. Um, coming from the world of SIP, I'm very interested in this because we failed miserably in SIP with something called a SIP SURI, where a UA uh, requires a TLS session almost all the way to the other UA because there's no proof what happens between the different proxy servers. And we're trying to fix that in various ways, but still haven't fixed it. So maybe this is a similar problem. I have a feeling that you're trying to solve the same problem as we do and how to set up a secure session the first hop and maybe do something with the following hops. Um, so I'm particularly interested in this work and see if I can steal some inspiration back to the zip core group. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks. I'll, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that SIPS uh, specification. I'll, I'll have a look at it. Um, you know, I will note that we are expecting a certain amount of good behavior on the part of intermedi intermediaries, but on the other hand, we're expecting that anyway if they're handling our email. Yeah, that, that's, this is Barry, that's really the key, that uh, if you say you're doing it, you're supposed to do it, and there's no verification that it actually happened. No. And, and I gather that SIP wanted that verification. Yeah, Ole back. Um, this is an old specification, but so far I haven't seen any implementation that actually actually follows the specification properly. Failing that, we have no other way to require a TLS session in the first hop, and that's something I really want to solve. Okay, so so I guess we went through all, all our agenda, and we really ask people to um, to continue work on uh, on the list, um, and I think. It, it even looks to me that based on, on these discussions, uh, we will decide later whether we meet face to face at the next meeting or not. Uh, really, let's let's uh, provide feedback on the list and uh, move forward this way. So I guess we're we're into. I'm going to mute you off, Jim. Thanks. Um, is there anybody? Um, we're in open mic, so open for um, other business. Um, you might get an hour back, approximately. Well, not quite an hour, but not seeing anybody rushing to the mic. I guess we close the meeting early, and uh, maybe see you in Seoul, or maybe not. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody who didn't sign the blue sheet, come up and do so. And there's there's one blue sheet um, thingy missing. Somewhere in the room. Ah, there it is. Thank you.